Hi guys, Claudia Bloom here, and today we're going to talk about the 9th of May 1536. So on this day, which in 1536 was a Tuesday, Henry VIII writes to Thomas Cromwell and asks for a meeting. The King's summons is quoted in a countdown by Claire Ridgway. He says he wants to see Cromwell for the treaty of such great and weighty matters, as whereupon doth consist the surety of our person, the preservation of our honour, and the tranquillity and quietness of you and all other our loving and faithful subjects. Like as at your arrival, here ye shall more plainly perceive and understand. So that's the king being quite vague here, but he's basically saying that his pride and his honour has been wounded, and he will tell Cromwell more about their plan when they meet. To me, this screams of guilt, some little secret meeting with with Cromwell that he doesn't want to explain the topic of fully in his summons. There are quite a few Henry apologists out there who like to forgive him for what he did to his wife. And what I will say for Henry is that growing up as the younger son and not thinking he's going to become the king, so not having any training for it, and then suddenly becoming the king very young and believing that you have ultimate power and are given this power by God, I do think that would mess with anyone's head, but to me that doesn't excuse his blatant cruelty towards people. This is not a king occasionally making bad decisions because he has wicked counsellors. I think this whole period of history with Anne really shows us what a callous and cold person Henry was. Then later on the 9th, when Henry and Cromwell have had this secret meeting, a load of noblemen and gentlemen are invited to Hampton Court Palace for a meeting. And again, this is kept extremely hush-hush. We don't know what was said in that meeting, but I'm pretty sure we can assume that it was about the upcoming trial and the situation with Anne and the men in the tower. So bear in mind, this is just one week after Anne Boleyn got arrested. So this has happened so, so fast. The whole situation with Catherine and the annulment went on for years. Henry is absolutely racing through this. There is no semblance anymore of this being a legitimate trial, a legitimate situation. I mean, truly, in my opinion, if Henry really thought there was a chance that Anne was guilty, which to me, <laughs> <laughs> there is no way that he thought that. But say that he did, then why on earth would he rush this through so quickly? That is not someone who wants to get the facts together before he makes a decision and wants a fair trial, is it? Also worth noting that one of the noblemen that Henry invites to this meeting of gentlemen and noblemen is Anne's evil uncle, Uncle Norfolk. So at this point, Thomas Cromwell is proposing that somehow <laughs> he already has enough evidence to put Anne and George and the others to trial. So I think that shows us that these proceedings have been going on behind the scenes for quite a long time. Now tomorrow I'm going to talk to you about the actual charges that they come up with, but I thought that today to get us ready for that, I might talk to you a little bit about who they've chosen or who they are going to choose for the jury. So just to further emphasize how incredibly unfair the judicial system is, is that this jury are going to be hand-picked noblemen. Essentially Cromwell and the King can pick whoever they think will support them. Now worse than that is that the person they are going to choose as the foreman of the jury is a man called Giles Heron. Now, Giles Heron is the son-in-law of a man called Sir Thomas More. Now, I don't know if you know about Thomas More, he's quite a famous Tudor figure, but I thought it would be relevant here to tell you a little bit more about him and his story because there are quite a few links to this one that will become important later. So Thomas More is a Roman Catholic and he is a fanatic. He cannot stand reform, he cannot stand Martin Luther. And actually, if we're talking about modern times, then in the year 2000, he was actually made a saint by the Pope. So him and another man, Bishop Fisher were eventually executed for their Catholic beliefs. And because of this, yes, they are officially now saints. And to me, that is hugely questionable, especially when it comes to Thomas More. Now, Thomas More is one of those Marmite figures in history because you have people who absolutely love him, think he's a great thinker of the age, someone to be celebrated, somebody to be sainted. And then you've got the other group of people who think he was a bit of a monster. Just for full disclosure, I'm going to admit that I am one of the people that thinks he was a terrible, terrible person based on the information that we have. And actually some of the Thomas More apologism stuff that we have going on today is hugely worrying to me. So Thomas More was a lawyer, he was a friend and a colleague of Cardinal Wolsey. Remember Cardinal Wolsey is somebody that Anne opposes because he is a member of the corrupt Catholic Church, he is very close to the King, he is somebody who hates reform, he is somebody who is confiscating books by Martin Luther, by William Tyndale. As I told you in the last video, this is something that's very relevant to Anne and George and Anne even had one of her books taken away from her by Wolsey. So Moore is one of Wolsey's friends, they are very loyal to Rome and to the Catholic Church. When Wolsey falls in 1529 because the king doesn't think he's pulling his weight with the annulment, it is Thomas More who is put in his position by the king. Now Anne and George would have been overjoyed that Wolsey was out of the picture, but he is about to be replaced with someone far worse. Thomas More is against 
everything that Anne and George stand for. It's not just that Thomas More dislikes reform, he believes that Catholics and the people of England should be at war with reformers and Lutherians. He really does describe it like that, he describes it as a war. And as we see with a lot of religious extremists throughout history, because he has this way that he thinks everything should be, he will be extremely evil and dehumanising to anyone he deems to be a sinner and a reformer. Thomas More is not just intolerant, he is dangerous. I spoke to you about him calling the religious situation of the day against reformers a war, so he calls it a call to war and he also writes that heresy must be controlled. So something that he and Wolsey used to do together is that they would try and stop any of the reformist literature being smuggled into England. Now as you know this is something that George and Anne were part of, they had books smuggled in for them, George was smuggling in books for Anne, they were sharing them round the court. So Moore and Wolsey were trying to hunt down the people that were distributing these books and they were actually burning these books. They considered these books to be so dangerous, they were burning them so that people couldn't read them. They were that desperate to stop people from reading the Bible in their own language. Now the situation is so extreme under Thomas More that a man that is accused of distributing the works of William Tyndale, a writer that Anne really approved of and actually the author of The Obedience of a Christian Man that she eventually gave to the king, the man who was accused of distributing these books was burned at the stake as a heretic. And this is something that Thomas More had absolutely no issue with. In his mind, he is doing this for the greater good. These are the sinners, these are the heretics, they must be wiped off the face of the earth in the most painful way possible. So this is going to be particularly distressing for Anne and George, because although they are partly shielded by their status in the nobility, although not completely shielded, they were still in danger, they're seeing people who don't have their privileges, who believe the same thing, and who were also trying to get this literature into the country and do what they think is right, they are seeing these people burn. And one day I'll make a video about why I personally believe that Anne became queen because there's an image of Anne, as I've said before, as a homewrecker, somebody who was so ambitious that she wanted all the power for herself. But if we really think about the context in which Anne lived and the things that really mattered to Anne and George and mattered to them throughout their lives right up until their deaths, their religious and political beliefs were such a huge part of them that we can't disentangle that from the decisions that they made in their lives. Now Anne did not go after the king, she was pursued by him for years. And and I think it makes total and logical sense and is actually very brave of her to try and use her position to further the cause of reform and to try and protect some of these people that they're seeing burned. Now on a slightly lighter note, something that amuses me greatly when we look back at historical records is people who think that the past <laughs> was free <laughs> from the sort of discourse that we have today. But Thomas More, Saint Thomas More I should call him, he had a foul mouth indeed. So what they would do back then, because they didn't have Twitter or social media to be arguing on, they would write their arguments down, and then other great thinkers and academics of the day would write their own responses to this. So in fact, quite a few times Thomas More responded to Martin Luther directly. Bear in mind Martin Luther is why the whole name Lutheranism exists, and he is a German reformer. Now I simply have to read you some of what Thomas More wrote in response to him, so you can get an idea of the sort of person that that Thomas More was, and I will warn you in advance, there is going to be some foul language <laughs> and swearing. Goodbye monetization on this video, goodbye. But it's worth it to drag Thomas More. So this is in response to Martin Luther's book that Thomas More heavily disagreed with. This is just a segment by the way, there's much more. But meanwhile, for as long as you and your reverend paternity will be determined to tell these shameless lies, others will be permitted on behalf of his English majesty to throw back into your paternity's shitty mouth. Truly the shit pool of all shit. All the muck and shit which your damnable rottenness has vomited it up. And to empty out all the sewers and privies onto your crown divested of the dignity of the priestly crown against which no less than against the kingly crown you have determined to play the buffoon. In your sense of fairness, honest reader, you will forgive me that the utterly filthy words of this scoundrel have forced me to answer such things for which I should have begged your leave. Now I consider truer than truth that saying, he who touches pitch will be wholly defiled by it, for I am ashamed even of this necessity, that while I clean out the fellow's shit-filled mouth, I see my own fingers covered with shit. 
I feel like there's a worrying obsession with shit going on in this response. And then in his second response, this is what he says. But if he proceeds to play the buffoon in the manner in which he has begun and to rave madly, if he proceeds to rage with calumny, to mouth trifling nonsense, to act like a raging madman, to make sport with buffoonery, and to carry nothing in his mouth but bilge water, sewers, privies, filth and dung, then let others do what they will. We will take timely counsel, whether we wish to deal with the fellow thus ranting according to his virtue and to paint with his colours, or to leave this mad friarlet and privy-minded rascal with his ragings and ravings, with his filth and dung, shitting and be shitted. Shitting and beshitted is truly one of my favourite phrases from any historical work we have. So this is the kind of language he's using. And bear in mind, this is not just someone like being angry with their friend somewhere and letting off some steam. This is something that he decided to write down and put into the world. He is that furious. He is that enraged by reform. He hates Luther that much. He can't stop talking about feces and mouths in a way that is really quite disturbing, I find. And this man, who I might add is also burning heretics at the state and quite enjoying it. <laughs> was sainted. Now there are also some sources, and we can't be 100% that these are true, but I personally think this probably is true, that Thomas More would torture and interrogate those he thought were heretics in his home. He did actually have a rack in his house. You know the torture device where they would stretch someone out on it, so that would have been absolutely agonising. He had one of those in his home. Now when these accusations came to light, he always denied them, but I think if we look at his language talking about a religious war, so he is a fanatic, he sees these people as, as enemies, he dehumanises them, he happily burns them, he has this furious, terrifying anger towards them, which is really sadistic and extreme. I personally think it's probably true. But something that is very relevant with Thomas More and ties his story into Anne and George's, aside from the fact that they would be bitter enemies because of their views and because of More's murderous actions, is that in 1535, a year before Anne and George end up in the tower, Thomas More actually finds himself in a similar position. So something that a lot of people admire about Thomas More is that he stuck to his principles. And I think this is interesting when we look at people in general from today, from history, it's like your favours problematic kind of thing. Um, can we see that there are positive traits in people that were awful? I think probably yes, you can see a trait that's positive. And one of the positive traits about Thomas More, not that he used it in a positive way, is that he stuck to his guns and he was true to his beliefs. So he wasn't a social climber, he didn't change to get higher up in the court, he did stick to what he believed in. Now Thomas More did not want to break with the Pope, he did not want to break from the Church of Rome, he was never happy about that. He wouldn't say that he agreed with Henry, that he wanted to annul his marriage to Catherine, and he's still Henry's friend at this point, but his open enmity to this whole proceeding with Anne and wanting to break from the Church is splitting him and Henry apart. So he's quite open about his doubts, although he won't directly oppose the King. But it all goes very wrong for him when he refused uses to agree to sign the Act of Succession. So the Act of Succession meant that Anne's children with Henry would be the heirs to the throne, so it meant making Mary the first, who would have been Lady Mary then, it would have meant agreeing that she was a bastard, and putting her one behind Elizabeth in the hierarchy. So actually Thomas More and Bishop Fisher, who are supporters of the Catholic Church, who are supporters of Catherine and Mary because they are Catholics, they would rather have Mary be before Elizabeth in the succession because they assume that any child of Anne's is going to be a reform and obviously any child of Catherine's is going to be a very strict Catholic. They want to see Mary on the throne, not Elizabeth. So Bishop Fisher and Thomas More will not sign the Act of Succession. This is the last straw for Henry, who decides to put them on trial for treason. So what links this to Anne's case is that when Henry becomes displeased with Thomas More, he actually makes up charges to try and get him convicted of treason. And I'm not saying that Thomas More was a good person. I personally think he should have been in prison in the Tower long ago. But what we do know is that the accusation against him were definitely false. So first of all they try to accuse Thomas More of accepting bribes, but he is able to prove that he never did that. Then they accuse him of working with a woman called Elizabeth Barton, who is known as the Nun of Kent, who made prophecies about how the annulment wouldn't stand. Henry tries to get him on that, but that is also proved false, because More is able to show them letters that he sent to her, which actually tell her to stop interfering in the process. Eventually when these tactics no longer work, he is taken in for treason because he won't sign that act of succession. So what we learn from this about Henry is that he is totally willing to make up false charges to quickly get rid of somebody 
who stands in his way, which is exactly what we see him doing in 1536 with Anne and George. Now this gets even more complicated because two of the people on the jury deciding if Thomas More is guilty or not are actually George and Anne's father Thomas and George himself. So Thomas Boleyn and George Boleyn find Thomas More guilty and they are part of the reason that he ends up being executed. Now from George's perspective you can completely understand this because this is a man who has been a burning reformers, stopping the spread of reformist texts, he's been apparently torturing reformers in his home, but secondly because he won't sign the act of succession, and that puts Elizabeth in danger, so George will have wanted to vote guilty to protect his niece. But George and Thomas Boleyn were both on that panel, they were both directly responsible. So going back to what started this story, we are going to have Thomas More's son-in-law as foreman of the jury that are going to decide the fates of Anne and George. Obviously this is not fair because this is somebody who's going to be hugely angry with Anne and George and will probably blame them for the death of Thomas More. Considering George was on the jury that decided the fate of his father-in-law, why on earth would he want to help George out? Why would he save George from being executed? Of course he wouldn't, he's going to want him executed. The story of Thomas More is also an example to show us this is why George and Anne knew what was coming, why they both made comments about knowing that the system wasn't fair because they had seen this happen before and George had even been part of this happening to somebody else. Although to be fair on him, this was a <laughs> an extremist who was burning and torturing people. I love you loads and I'll see you tomorrow when we talk about the charges that are brought against Anne and George. Okay, be safe, love you, bye!